I want to begin just by talking a little bit about Spurgeon himself. I would venture to say every one of us here this evening is familiar with the name Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Um, if not, you ought to be, because Spurgeon is easily regarded the greatest Baptist preacher who has ever lived. But I would add to that, he is the greatest preacher of the English language who has ever lived. I would add to that, Spurgeon, I think, is arguably the greatest preacher since the Apostle Paul. He is worthy of our focus. He is called by many the prince of preachers. I would say he is the undisputed prince of preachers. If John Calvin was the greatest theologian the church has known, and I believe that he was, if Jonathan Edwards is the greatest philosopher, if George Whitfield is the greatest evangelist, then Charles Haddon Spurgeon, I believe, is easily the greatest pastor, preacher, evangelist to occupy one pulpit, which he did for 38 years. And the thrust of this book is that Spurgeon held Calvinism in one hand, he held evangelism in the other hand, and he married the two, I believe, perhaps, as no other pastor ever has. Uh, just to give a few of the accolades for Spurgeon, there's no shortage of accolades, but just a few. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, the doctor, has said of Spurgeon that he is one of the greatest preachers of the last century, if not the greatest of all. Uh, 19th century England, that Victoria era, is probably the most fertile cradle for preachers. And Spurgeon easily stood out for, of all of those great English preachers of the 19th century. But I would add again, I think he's the greatest preacher of any century going back to the first century. James Montgomery Boyce writes that Spurgeon was one of the greatest evangelists England has ever seen and one of the country's staunchest defenders of the doctrines of grace. In other words, Spurgeon had the depth of Calvinism, but the breadth of a passionate evangelism. That's what all of us want in our ministries, in our lives. We want the depth. We want to be rooted and grounded in the doctrines of grace. But we want the breadth of red-hot evangelism and proclaiming the gospel of Christ to a lost and dying world. And Spurgeon is the epitome of this. Al Mohler, who was a part of this conference, has written, Spurgeon was a legend in his own day. He stands alone as the most, inf as the most widely appreciated and influential preacher of his century. Spurgeon preached a full-bodied gospel with Calvinist convictions and an evangelistic appeal. When you take Calvinism and when you take evangelism and bring them together, it's like gas and fire. And when you bring them together, there is an explosion. If all you have is Calvinism, you're going to end up with stoic eggheads <laughs> who are just staring at their navel. If all that you have is evangelism, I believe you'll have a manipulative evangelism and there will be untold numbers who have a false assurance of their unconverted state. The only one who plays with a full deck is a Calvinistic evangelist. He has a two-edged sword. He has everything at his disposal. And so it was with Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Let me give you a fly over his life very quickly. He was born June the 19th, 1834 in Kelvington, uh, England near Essex. He was born into a family of preachers. His father was a pastor, his grandfather was a pastor, and he came from Dutch and French Huguenot stock. Uh, he grew up reading uh, the Puritans from his grandfather's house. Yet he was not converted until age 15. You're perhaps familiar with the account of how he was walking to church, a snowstorm blew in, he was diverted uh, unintentionally to a small Methodist chapel. There were only 12 people there that Sunday. The preacher couldn't even make it. Uh, a layman had to stand up, and he took for his text 
Isaiah 45, 22, look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. And Charles Haddon Spurgeon was dramatically converted under the preaching of the Word of God, and it would mark his life. He immediately began to preach. He started preaching at age 16. His gifts were immediately noticed, and at age 17, he began pastoring his first church. Uh, The church more than doubled. His reputation began to grow far and wide, and at age 19, he was called to London to the most historic Baptist church in all of England, the New Park Baptist Church. And there he became the pastor at age 19. The sanctuary held 1,200. It had dwindled down to 200. They were a desperate congregation. And they took this young preacher prodigy, Spurgeon, and Spurgeon began to preach in this empty sanctuary. And within the year, it was standing room only. In fact, you had to have a ticket to get into church, even for the midweek service. The hand of God was obviously upon Spurgeon. Uh, Soon, they had to move the church services into Exeter Hall, and there were some five… it held 5,000. Every Sunday morning, every Sunday evening, at age 20, he was preaching to 5,000 people, and there were traffic jams in front of the uh, Exeter Hall. He was… he was a phenomenon. Uh, They had to move into a larger building, and at age 22, they moved into the music hall at Royal Garden, Surrey, which held 12,000 people. Every service for the next several years were, were filled. In fact, Spurgeon said, I cannot point to a single seat in the entire building, but that there was someone converted to Christ in each of the seats in that extraordinary facility. Uh, The city of London had not experienced anything like this since the days of George Whitfield a hundred years earlier. Uh, At age 23, he preached to the largest gathering of its day, uh, to over 23,000 people on a day of national prayer and fasting, that while he was but 23 years of age became obvious that they needed to uh, build a facility, a permanent facility. And so, the Metropolitan Tabernacle was built, and they moved into it when Spurgeon was 26 years old. It held 6,000 people. It was the largest Protestant worship sanctuary in the world. And Charles Haddon Spurgeon preached the gospel there as perhaps few have ever preached the gospel. He began to found ministries. At, at age 23, for example, he founded the pastor's college. Uh, having never attended a pastor's college himself, having never attended seminary, but young men began to gather around him, and they, they were drawn to the fire that was in the pulpit as he was preaching the Word of God. And Spurgeon began training a new generation of men to preach the Word of God. Countless other ministries were established. Uh, His sermons were put into what was called the penny pulpit. Uh, They were transcribed on the front pew. They would be type was set, put in front of him on Monday. He would make one edit. And then they were sold on the streets of London for a penny hence the penny pulpit. They were cabled across the Atlantic to America. Uh, The sermons were printed in full in various newspapers here in America. They were spread throughout Europe, uh, throughout Australia, New Zealand. Uh, There was one order for a quarter of a million of just one sermon. Uh, One uh, man in Europe ordered one million copies of one sermon to be distributed throughout the continent. Uh, The world has never seen a preaching uh, phenom quite like Charles Spurgeon. Uh, There are 63 volumes of his sermons. I have all of them in my my office. And they, in that, they took simply the 50 best of a particular year. But he preached on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and throughout the week, uh, throughout London and throughout England. And 
these, this collection of sermons uh, total some 4,000 sermons, and it is the largest such set by any author on any subject, not just Christianity. So, he was such a productive man. He died in January 31st, 1892, at age 57. Uh, there were five funerals. Some 50,000 people viewed the body. Uh, the picture above is taking the casket into the cemetery. Uh, there were some 12,000 people who just stood in respect at the gate entering into the cemetery. Uh, he is the prince of preachers. And so, I want to ask, what is, the, what is the, the inner core of the secret of his great preaching? Time does not permit me to trace this out in every direction, his confidence in the Word of God. He was known for preaching Christ and, and Christ crucified. He would say a sermon without Christ is like an ocean without water. It's like bread without flour. It's like a well without water. It's like the sky without the sun. He said a sermon without Christ is an awful thing. He preached Christ in Christ alone. And at the heart of his preaching of Christ was his red-hot Calvinism. Uh, he was a staunch Calvinist, and the reason was is because he was so biblical. He was committed to the authority of the Word of God, and there was no place else for him to go but that the Scripture clearly taught the doctrines of grace. He said, I, I believe nothing merely because Calvin taught it, and we would say amen to that. But because I have found his teaching in the Word of God. Spurgeon said, unless you can put finger on chapter and verse, I will not believe it. It mattered not what some reformer taught. All that mattered is what is Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have to say. What does Jesus, the head of the church, have to say? And it was the reformers, we believe, who excavated the minds of Scripture and brought the gold forth. And Spurgeon stood on the shoulders of these great reformers, but he had struck gold himself in the mountains of Scripture. As Spurgeon was rooted and grounded in the Scripture. He says, Calvinism did not spring from Calvin. We believe that it sprang from the great founder of all truth, capital F, Calvin derived it mainly from the writings of Augustine. Augustine obtained his views without a doubt through the Spirit of God from the diligent study of the writings of Paul, and Paul received them of the Holy Ghost from Jesus Christ. And we say amen to this. Spurgeon became the single most popular preacher of Calvinism, I think, in any century. Spurgeon said the old truth that Calvin preached that Augustine preached, that Paul preached, is the truth that I must preach today, or else be false to my conscience and to my God. I cannot shape the truth. I know of no such thing as paring off the rough edges of a doctrine. John Knox's gospel is my gospel, and that which thundered through Scotland must thunder through England again today. And I would add, it must thunder through Orlando and Atlanta, and Kansas City, and Los Angeles, and New York again, because it is the truth of the Word of God. <laughs> Spurgeon clearly set forth the five points of Calvinism. He was a card-carrying five-point Calvinist. Unashamedly, in fact, when the Metropolitan Tabernacle was opened on April the 11th, 1861, the first sermon to be preached by Spurgeon in this largest Protestant worship house was a message entitled, An Exposition of the Doctrines of Grace. And he proclaimed the five points of Calvinism and then had five other preachers preach after him, one each on the five headings of the doctrines of grace. And just quickly, some of his quotes on the doctrines of grace, on total depravity. The venom of sin is in the very fountain of our being. It has poisoned our heart. 
It is in the very marrow of our bones and is as natural to us as anything that belongs to us. He believed not only in that the mind is darkened and that the heart is defiled, but the will is dead and in bondage to sin and Satan and suffers moral inability and cannot believe in Jesus Christ. For after all, what can a dead man do? And the answer to that is nothing except stink. That is all that a dead man can do. And except for the Spirit of God, resurrect and raise the dead sinner to life and to repentance and faith, there is no coming to Christ. Spurgeon taught unconditional election. He said, whatever may be said about the doctrine of election, it is written in the Word of God as with an iron pen, and there is no getting rid of it. The grass withers, the flower fades away, but the Word of our God abides forever. It is forever written in Scripture that He has chosen us in Christ from before the foundation of the world. Spurgeon believed in definite atonement. And I I will tell you this, I have some barn burner quotes on definite atonement that I have found and put, and time does not permit me to share these with you right now, but just one. Spurgeon said, regarding definite atonement, I would rather believe a limited atonement that is efficacious for all men for whom it was intended than a universal atonement that is not efficacious for anybody except the will of man be joined with it. Uh, The fact is, everyone limits the atonement. It's either you limit the extent or you limit the application. But Spurgeon believed that Christ died for the sheep of Christ, that He bought the church with His own blood. He taught irresistible grace. A man is not saved against his will, but he is made willing by the operation of the Holy Ghost. A mighty grace which he does not wish to resist enters into the man, disarms him, and makes a new creature of him and he is saved, close quote. In other words, it is the Holy Spirit, Spurgeon said, who overcomes our resistance. And it is He who makes us willing in the day of His power, and that all glory goes to God, for He is the one who has applied salvation to our rebellious hearts. And He taught preserving grace. He said, if ever one child of God did perish, or if I knew it were possible that one could, I should conclude at once that I must, and I suppose each one of you would do the same. No, he believed that all the sheep which were purchased by Christ and brought to saving faith in Him shall be safely guarded and carried all the way to glory, and not a one of His sheep shall perish." So, Spurgeon was committed to the doctrines of grace. He said concerning the fact that it is necessary, it is necessary to preach these truths. He said, I question whether we have preached the whole counsel of God unless predestination with all of its solemnity and sureness is continually declared. He affirmed that every preacher must teach these truths. He said, some of you have never preached upon election since you were ordained. These things, you say, are offensive. And so, gentlemen, you would rather offend God than you would offend man? But you reply, these things will not be practical. I do do think that the climax of all man's blasphemy is centered upon that utterance. No, these truths are gloriously practical. They are the greatest pride crusher. They are the greatest worship enlarger. They are the greatest fire for evangelism. They launch missions. They bring the fear of God to the hearts of men. They purify the souls of those who are followers of Christ. No, it is these truths that give boldness and confidence to God's people to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. Spurgeon went on to say, tell me that God put a thing in the Bible that I am not to preach? 
you are finding fault with my God. But you say it will be dangerous. What? God's truth dangerous? I should not like to stand in your shoes when you have to face your Maker on the day of judgment after such an utterance of that. And I'll tell you this, Spurgeon went on to say it is nothing but popery. It is popery that says that the truth must be withheld from the common man, that only the Pope and only the cardinals and only the, the laity can understand the Bible, but that the people are just too ignorant and too stupid and too pedestrian in life to understand the truth. The Roman Catholic Church has held back the truth for centuries from, from their people, and Spurgeon applies this to the doctrines of grace. And he says, to withhold these glorious truths is nothing more than to fashion your ministry after Rome. Spurgeon went on to say, God gave me this great book to preach from, and if He has put anything in it you think is not fit, go and complain to Him. In other words, it's not my message, it's God's message. And we are to declare it from the housetops. Let me tell you, Spurgeon said, the reason why many of our churches are declining is just because this doctrine has not been preached. He went on to say, I am often charged with preaching doctrines that may do a great deal of hurt. I have my witnesses here present to prove that the things which I have preached have done a great deal of hurt, but they have not done hurt to morality or to God's church, the hurt has been to Satan. It has crushed the kingdom of darkness. The sovereignty of God is a treasure that God's people cling to. He said, these are the old truths of Scripture, and we must come back to these old paths. Spurgeon said, it is no new novelty then that I am preaching, no new doctrine. I love to proclaim these strong old doctrines. They are called by nickname Calvinism, but which are surely and verily the revealed truth of God as it is in Christ Jesus. By this truth, I make my pilgrimage into the past, and as I go, I see church father after church father, confessor after confessor, martyr after martyr, standing up to shake hands with me." Close quote. It is a long line of godly men down through the centuries who have blown this trumpet in Zion and who have declared these truths from the housetops. So he held Calvinism in one hand. He held evangelism in the other hand. And Spurgeon said, I've had only one model in the ministry, and it is not John Calvin. It is George Whitfield. The great evangelist George Whitfield is my model in all things, he said. Spurgeon said, other men seem to be only half alive, but Whitfield was all life, fire, wind, force. My own model, if I may have such a thing and do subordination to my Lord, is George Whitfield with unequaled footsteps must I follow His glorious track." And by the way, it was Martin Lloyd-Jones who said of Whitfield, other men merely existed, Whitfield lived. Robert Murray McShane said, oh, for one week of Whitfield's life. Spurgeon said, that is my model, that he is my mentor in the ministry. So, Spurgeon was committed to preaching the gospel, pleading, urging, exhorting, begging sinners to come to the cross and to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He extended the free offer of the gospel constantly and continually and pleaded with lost sinners to come this very moment to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was once asked, how do you reconcile divine sovereignty and human responsibility? And Spurgeon replied, I never have to reconcile friends. Divine sovereignty and human responsibility have never had a falling out with each other. I do not need to reconcile what God has joined together. 
Where these two truths meet, I do not know, do, nor do I want to know. They do not puzzle me since I have given up my mind to believing them both. And listen, that's exactly the way it is with us in the doctrine of the Trinity. Is God one or is He three? The answer is yes. Is Jesus Christ fully God or is He fully man? The answer is yes. Who wrote Romans? Did God write, is that God's book or did Paul write it? The answer is yes. We can go through every major doctrine in the Bible, and there is tension. And Spurgeon understood that as we come to the doctrine of election and the free offer of the gospel. Which is it? The answer is yes. We embrace it all as believers in the full counsel of God. Now, I want to set before you two sermons very quickly. I just want you to see how Spurgeon laid this out. One is a sermon I read 35 years ago. I'll never forget reading this sermon on John 6, verse 37. All that the Father has given me shall come to me, and him who comes unto me I shall in no wise cast out. There you have in one verse the sovereignty of God in salvation, and you have the free offer of the gospel in the second half of the same verse. And what Spurgeon would do, and I have the outline in front of you, his first main heading was, as he preached this sermon, grace triumphant in speciality. And time does not permit me to look at each of these subheadings, but what he laid out in indisputable uh, logic and exegesis from the text is that every single one of the elect whom the Father chose, He gave to the Son, and within time they shall be brought to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not a one will be lost. And then for the second half of the sermon, He moved to the second main heading, grace triumphant in its liberality, and He moved into pleading, urging calling people to faith in Christ. The gates of paradise are swung wide open. This is a day of opportunity for you to commit your life to Jesus Christ. And if you will come, you will not be cast out. And in his mind, he began to reason what people would be saying who yet need to come to Christ, that I have rejected the gospel again and again and again, but the offer still goes out. It is never too late to give your life to Christ. This sermon I would just urge you to read on your own, but it is a glorious example of his evangelistic fire. I'll give you one other. I don't have time to, to comment on it, and I don't have a slide for it, but a sermon that he preached compelled them to come in. From Luke 14 and verse 23, how God's servants are to go out into the highways and into the byways, and whoever they find, we must compel them to come in. And Spurgeon moves through every angle on what it means to compel an unbeliever to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Everything from bold proclamations to open invitations to tender appeals, sound reasonings, compelling persuasions, authoritative commands, as well as severe warnings if you do not come to faith this very day in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to conclude with this other sermon. I'll never forget reading this sermon some 30 years ago. The title of the sermon is simply, Now. It's from 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. And Spurgeon models for us the urgency with which we must preach the gospel. The, the sense of immediacy. And my fear is that many who are Calvinists have actually in practice become hyper-Calvinists, where there is no pleading for lost sinners to come to Christ this very moment. In doctrine, they may not be hyper-Calvinists, but in practice, they are. Listen to Spurgeon in this sermon now as he is preaching 
The most of men procrastinate. It is not that they resolve to be damned, but they resolve to be saved tomorrow. It is not that they reject Christ forever, but that they reject Christ today. And truly, they might as well reject Him forever as continue perpetually to reject Him today. Spurgeon would go on to say, tomorrow is the devil's day. Today is God's day. There are souls who have procrastinated towards Christ, and they have procrastinated their very souls into hell. If you are to be saved, you must believe in Christ now, today, while the offer is being presented. Spurgeon said, now is the day of salvation. You need it now. God is angry with you now. You are condemned already. Now without God, now without hope, now an alien from the commonwealth of Israel, now dead in trespasses and sins, now in danger of the wrath to come, now therefore you need to be saved. He goes on to say, but sir, I do not think such a thing should be done in a hurry. A hurry? What does David say? I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. A hurry? When a man is on the edge of damnation and on the borders of the grave, do not talk of hurry, sir, when it is a case of life and death. Let us fly as swift as a flash of lightning. Spurgeon said, if the gospel command were think and be saved, I would cheerfully allow you a month's thinking. But the command is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and now is the accepted time. Well, says one, I do not feel convinced enough. Dear friend, you do not, need, you do not think that now is the accepted time? Here is a quarrel that you have with God. God says now, you say no. He went on to say, you say, yes, but I would like to get home and pray. My text does not say it will be the accepted time when you get home and pray. It says now, and as I find you are now in this pew, now is the accepted time. Now, you think about that. Delayed obedience is no obedience. Delayed obedience is disobedience. We have become way too passive in our preaching of the gospel, way too passive in our witnessing and sharing the gospel with others. Tomorrow is the devil's day. Today is God's day. Spurgeon went on to say, if you trust Christ now, you will be accepted. If now you are enabled to throw yourself simply into the hands of Christ, now is the accepted time between you and God. And then he went on to say, some of my hearers who listened to me last year and in the years that are past are now, now in hell, now where no hope can come, now where no gospel shall be preached, now where they bitterly reject their wasted Sabbaths, now where memory holds a dreadful reign, now where their worm dies not and the fire is quenched not. There are souls in hell now because they procrastinated yesterday, is what Spurgeon said. Ian Murray in his book, Forgotten Spurgeon, said he puts the sinner in the vice grip. On one side, he tightens divine sovereignty and says, you cannot believe. With the other vice grip, he tightens it and says, you must believe and tightens it, tightens it, until there is such deep consternation and deep upheaval within the soul that they throw themselves upon God's mercy, and the sinner is begging God to save them. Spurgeon said, I always feel that I have not done my duty as a preacher of the gospel if I go out of this pulpit without having clearly set before sinners the way of salvation. I mean, after all, we are ministers of the new covenant, are we not? After all, we are commissioned by the head of the church to preach the gospel to every living creature. 
Spurgeon said, preach the gospel, the gates of hell shake. Preach the gospel, prodigals return. Preach the gospel to every creature, it is the master's mandate. In other words, this is non-negotiable. You may be a barber, but if you don't cut hair, you're not a barber. You may call yourself a bus driver, but if you don't drive a bus, you're not a bus driver. You may call yourself a preacher, but if you don't preach the gospel and urge people to come to faith in Christ, you're not a preacher. My last slide. May God put this into our hearts and souls. May I be like this. May you be like this. This is what true Calvinism communicates. If sinners will be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms around their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions, and let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. It is hyper-Calvinism, that dreaded death stench that does not plead with lost sinners to come to Christ. It is that death stench upon a church that does not pray for the lost to come to faith in Christ. God deliver us from the abominable disease of hyper-Calvinism. God give us true Calvinism. Give us biblical Calvinism. Give us gospel preaching Calvinism. Give us cross-centered, Christ-exalting Calvinism that offers the gospel and pleads with lost sinners to come this very moment to faith in Jesus Christ, and then to leave the results with a sovereign God in heaven who will save His own people from their sins. In this book, The Gospel Focus of Charles Spurgeon, I have tried to show his commitment to the doctrines of grace, but also his fierce commitment to be a soul winner and to be an evangelist with the gospel. Spurgeon said, I would rather lead one soul to Christ than to unpick all the mysteries of the Bible. May God use us to lead souls to Christ. And those of us who stand in pulpits, let us preach as though souls are truly perishing and that there is but one Savior who is Jesus Christ, our Lord. God bless you.